Have you filmed a lot of collabs? Uh, I don't think I've ever filmed a collab. Is this true? I'm not sure I've ever filmed a collab in person. Okay, well, well. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. How do I even start videos? Hey, what's up, you guys? Yeah, you guys? <laughs> I just start talking about climate change. <laughs> I'm just Always. like, yeah. so the thing about climate change. So, hi everyone. Okay, I'm sorry. Welcome, I guess, back to my channel. Now I sound like Jeffree Star. Hi everyone. Today, what I wanted to do was talk about climate modeling. So, I brought in an expert, Climate Adam. <laughs> He has his own channel, which is called Climate Adam, and you're our modeling expert. Okay, well, hopefully I'll live up to um, expectations. Although if you're expecting someone to give you advice on like runway modeling, then you're going to be disappointed. So I started my YouTube channel when I was still doing my doctorate in atmospheric physics at the University of Oxford. And um, yeah, atmospheric physics is just like the physics side of kind of climate science and I was looking at climate change and I was using climate models um, as a big part of my research. Um, I have used climate models, I do kind of know a little bit about them and so I guess that's why I'm here to try and, try and explain what I know. Before we get into climate models, we wanted to discuss what a model is. So uh, models aren't something that are limited to climate change, they're also, I think often when we think about models, we think about computer models explicitly, mm -hmm. but models are kind of in all of science, a model is just kind of a simplified uh, version of a real thing. So the, the example that I mentioned earlier was a globe. Um, a globe is a model of the Earth. But um, like all models, they're good for some things and not for others. So a globe is maybe really good for working out the distance between different things or having an intuition for kind of uh, where the sun's going to come in at different times. But if you want to know by just looking at a globe, um, how, Maybe topology? Yeah, or... things like topology on a normal globe, you're not going to really get that very mm -hmm. well. Yeah, mm. so there's this quote, and we don't know who it's from, <laughs> but everyone that uh, has worked with models knows this quote, and it's, all models are wrong, so, but some are more useful than others. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going into climate models, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to explain how I think climate models work, and Adam was going to correct me, or maybe just add to my story and take it in a different direction. We'll, we'll see how well you do. Yes. <laughs> so the way I think climate models work is that to start off with a climate model, you start off with a grid of the earth, like maybe square kilometer or every square meter, you start off with a grid of the planet. So I think that's not the starting point. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the starting point is the kind of laws of physics that you want to try and capture. So you start with equations like the Navier-Stokes equation, which describe um, the flow of fluids. Mm -hmm. um, and for the globe, that needs to be the fl flow of fluids around a sphere. Um, and so dealing with the flow of fluids, dealing with kind of things like evaporation. So just the, the like physical laws, the scientific laws that you want uh, that, that you know the world mm -hmm. relies on for, for weather, for climate. Um, so yeah, you start with those physical principles before you do anything else, I would say, is the starting point. So the next thing I was going to say was that um, once you have the grid, which I guess we'll go back to, um, then you start with like a model of the Earth's atmosphere, which I was assuming would be atmospheric motion, which is used which is modeled using the Navier-Stokes equations, which to me is what it sounds like you just described. Mm -hmm. In addition to this atmospheric model, like when does the grid come in? <laughs> yeah, so I guess the grid comes in because, uh, as you mentioned, you can't perfectly solve the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, and so uh, you have to make some kind of approximation. The common way of trying to um, understand the weather and the climate and to build a model that can do this is to divide the world into a grid. So you'll have kind of a longitude, latitude, height okay. grid. Um, and so you've got these um, kind of cube, cuboids uh, okay. kind of shapes. And within each of these, you kind of say it's got kind of uniform properties. So kind of the air is a particular temperature or if it's in the ocean, the water is a particular temperature. The water's got a certain amount of saltiness the wind is a certain amount, there's a certain amount of clouds, but kind of in this grid 
square or grid cuboid, everything's more or less the same. You just mentioned the ocean temperature. Is that kind of a boundary condition? Yeah, so it, it, it depends. You get some models which are atmosphere ocean, uh, atmosphere only. Um, they're called general circulation models, the specific kind of climate models we're talking about. Um, so you get some which are just for the atmosphere, you get some which are just for the ocean, but mm -hmm. you get um, now, the, I would say the main ones that uh, we look at are, have an ocean and an atmosphere model, which make up the climate model. Okay, um, and so then the earth would be a boundary condition? Like the, the terrain? Sorry, not the earth. The whole yeah. Time. yeah but <laughs> like the, the terrain? Yeah, so the shape of um, yeah the earth. So you'd say, here's a mountain, here's where the ocean is, here's where land is. There's quite a lot of things smaller than that grid square, which... Uh, which might be important, but you can't quite capture because you need to do this approximation. Do people investigate more smaller, like higher resolution, but don't resolve the entire planet? Do they find have different findings? Yes, and that's actually really, really important. So um, you actually use the results from those kinds of models. Probably you use the results from those almost every day without knowing it, because those are the models which we use for weather prediction. Okay. So the models we use um, for looking at climate change and the models we use for looking at weather prediction, they're basically the same. Um, they use the same physical principles, they divide the world into a grid, they're mm -hmm. looking at the same processes. But for weather models, we tend to just look at a smaller area. You know, if, it's, um, if we're looking at the weather in the UK, we just look at just the UK rather mm -hmm. than the whole world. And we're just looking for a few days rather than looking at kind of what's going to happen over 100 years or so. So we have the grid, we have the atmospheric ocean model. Then I'm assuming that climate change models, you're either using them two ways. The first way is you're throwing in different, different amounts of different chemicals into the atmosphere. So say you're increasing the amount of methane or you're increasing the amount of nitrous oxides. Um, so you're changing the model in this way and then you're just letting the earth acclimate and you're seeing what's happening. Or there's another way which is we increase the earth's temperature and then we see what happens to uh, the planet. Is that correct? <laughs> so yeah, it might be that sometimes people change the temperature to a certain amount and see what happens. I don't know that much which would do that. I think it's much more the, the first thing you mentioned. Okay. So much more common to, um, to change the atmospheric concentrations and see what happens from, from what I know. I think, I imagine people still do. But basically, once you've got a climate model, you can mess around with it however you want. What's going to happen if we multiply the amount of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. in the atmosphere by 100 or we stop clouds from being able to form? You can just, you can play around with um, what's going on in the model to see what happens. And yeah, the most useful things are to um, change the atmospheric concentrations yeah. in ways we think they might might really change in the mm -hmm. future and see how this, this model Earth response. I mean, from different papers and from different predictions, there's always different temperatures predicted. Mm -hmm. So why is there a discrepancy between models if it sounds like, um, like pretty straightforward what we just talked about? Yeah, so there's no one climate model and it's important that there isn't because I, we've already spoken about the fact that models aren't perfect um, and different um, institutions have different climate models. So um, you know, NASA have their own climate model, the UK Met Office have their own climate mm. model, and every few years they update it and bring in better physics and smaller grids and things like that. Um, but each climate model has different assumptions put in it, different approximations, and depending on those, uh, they behave in slightly different ways. Um, they show slightly different things happening, and one of the differences is exactly how hot the world will get in the future. What one of those difference isn't is whether the world will get hot in the future. I've never seen uh, a general circulation model that um, that doesn't show the world warming as we okay. add more carbon dioxide in. If all you're doing is saying, okay, what happens if we add a bunch more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere? Every climate model is going to show you the world warming, which is what you'd expect. I'm, I'm curious to know what are the different assumptions that... Like, do you have any off of the top of your head? One of the things which is really important to understand um, 
to, to understand how much the world will warm is um, clouds. Um, mm. How will clouds change as the world warms? As the world warms, there'll be more water vapor in the atmosphere. As we emit more aerosols into the atmosphere, they have a cooling effect, but they help form more clouds. Will these clouds absorb more of the radiation going out or the radiation coming in? There are all these questions. But if you think about it, we mentioned this grid, which is a couple of hundred kilometers across. Mm -hmm. So that's way too big to to resolve what's going on with individual clouds. Mm -hmm. So instead you have to kind of approximate the processes which lead to clouds and none of those approximations are perfect, of course. Um, and different climate models will have different assumptions when they like simulate their clouds. So clouds are the problem. I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> say they're the problem. I'm not, don't abolish clouds. Okay. <laughs> Why isn't it just easier to make a smaller grid and then just um, let the computer, supercomputer run for a decade? I guess because we need answers now. Yeah, there's okay. nothing fundamental that stops us from making a smaller grid. You know, there's no like reason we can't. We use smaller grids for weather forecasting. It's just the smaller your grid, the more calculations you need to do to, um, to simulate mm -hmm. um, because each grid square needs taking account of. And already state-of-the-art climate models run on massive supercomputers. They might take many months to perform one simulation. You need to perform many simulations because you want to say, what mm -hmm. happens if carbon dioxide does this? What happens if carbon dioxide does that? What happens if carbon dioxide stays the same, but we emit loads more aerosols? So mm -hmm. you want to run loads of different simulations. You want to look, look at simulating the past to see how well your climate model compares to what happened in the past. But in theory, sure, you can make a smaller grid and leave your climate model running for like 100 mm -hmm. years and then find out what it says. But that's not going to be very useful because in 100 years time, we, well, yeah, we will have just seen what happens with climate yeah, change. Yeah, exactly. All of these climate models, they predict an increase in temperature of the Earth. But why do we work so hard on these models if we know that they're you know not accurate or they're all a bit wrong i get I, it comes back to the point we said at the beginning which is that all models climate or otherwise are a bit wrong but you know some are useful in certain ways and what i like to think about is um crash test dummies so um you know we know car crashes are going to happen um to find out the consequence of car crashes. We don't just want to wait for them to happen or even test out car crashes on real humans and see mm -hmm. what happens to them. We use crash test dummies to try out loads of different situations, see what works, what doesn't work in the car and make things safer. Well, it's the same for climate change. We know that what we're doing is heating the planet. Mm -hmm. we, we don't want to just wait and see how bad it gets. We want to, we want to find out. And even though these climate models um, these, these crash test dummies of the planet aren't perfect. They give us um, a good sense in, lot, in lots of ways of what we're in for. So that's really useful. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to discuss all these nerdy things with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, if you guys want to check out his channel, it's linked below. It's called Climate Adam. And you make videos about... Climate change. Climate change. <laughs> yeah, uh, generally not actually as nerdy as this, so I oh, okay. have to up my nerdiness for today. <laughs> so thank you guys for watching, and yeah, see you next in two weeks. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>